complicated. Um, welcome uh, to uh, this symposium on um, Al Pasha's uh, new book, uh, Night March, Among India's Revolutionary Guerrillas. Um, Alpa spent uh, 20 months uh, with the Indian Maoists uh, and documented uh, her experiences um, over, over several years. Uh, and this book is, is the outcome um, of, uh, of that, that experience, that journey um, that, uh, that Alpa had gone through. Um, and um, she's here to speak with uh, Kaya Bagh uh, about some of the ideas, some of the insights um, uh, of, uh, of that experience. Uh, so I just want to introduce them, and I'll uh, explain the format, um, and then um, I'll hand it over to Alpa. Alpa Shah is uh, Associate Professor in Anthropology at the London School of Economics, uh, and she's the author of In the Shadows of the State, and also co-author of Ground Down by Growth. And uh, she's presented on um, various BBC documentaries, including India's uh, Red Belt for uh, BBC Radio 4's Crossing Continents. Um, you can check out her website. Um, she's um, an accomplished um, author and academic. Uh, and Kaya Bag is editor at New Left Review, and associate publisher of Tribune magazine, and we're very pleased um, to have her here. So Alpa will speak uh, for about 40 minutes, presenting uh, the ideas in the book, and then Kaya will um, say some words about her, um, her insights, her uh, writing on the, on the Maoist movement more generally uh, for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll open up um, for questions, um, and then, yeah, uh, we'll take a few and uh, have, a, have, a, have a discussion. Okay, thank you. So, I'll pass. Thanks, Faisy. Um, thanks very much for inviting me to present the book. I mean, this is a department that's very dear to me, and I've worked very closely with colleagues, uh, colleagues here uh, to work on our last book, Ground Down by Growth. Um, so, and thanks, Kea, for coming on board. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing your thoughts. It's really difficult to present a book like this um, because it's about so many different issues and also because um, so much of it is about, you know, how it's, how it's put across the writing. Um, so what I'm going to do is maybe give you some extracts and um, then also some of the broader, the context and also some of the broader uh, analysis. And, uh, yeah, so just bear with me. So let's go deep into the forested hills of Jharkhand on a freezing December night in 2008 when I went, made my way past three sentry posts to a solitary mud hut set apart from the rest of the village. The soft-spoken, slightly balding, middle-aged man inside went by a nom de guerre, Gyanji. And like the guerrilla platoon outside guarding their leader, Gyanji was dressed in olive green fatigues and carried all his worldly belongings in one small rucksack. But in the dim light that was spreading from the kerosene lamp, I noticed the tender soles of his light-skinned feet. He had been constantly on the move in the rural backwaters of India, often sleeping under the stars in the forest, rarely staying more than a few days in one place. But in contrast to the dark, broad feet of the tribal soldiers outside, layered with years' worth of skin, which made them as tough, dry, and cracked as the red earth they had walked barefoot since they were born, Gyanji's feet were still soft from the childhood care and protection they had received in his parents' upper-caste home. In the hills, where the local tongue of Nagpuria trilled through the forests like song, and even India's majority language, Hindi, was a rarity, Gyanji's polished English stood out. He could recite Shelley and Shaw, had a master's degree in mathematics, and his siblings included a bank employee, an accountant, and a computer scientist who had emigrated to Canada. It was only Gyanji who had gone astray from the upper middle class path laid out by his parents. Inspired by the revolutionary spirit in the universities around him and by the peasant rebellions that had been sweeping through India in the three decades before, aged 24, Gyanji cut ties with his family and took the oath of becoming a professional revolutionary. He joined a group of men and women who had renounced the comforts of their homes and their university classrooms and had declassed and decasted themselves and, in a long tradition of revolutionary Marxism-Leninism resolved to fight oppression, injustice, and inequality to make a more humane world. 
Today, these people call themselves the Communist Party of India Maoist, also known as the Naxalites or Maoists, and are leading what is now the world's longest ongoing armed revolutionary movement. So this is in um, one of their camps uh, that the end of this march that this book focus, so uses as a kind of narrative device and focuses on, uh, ends, ends on, and you can see their, um, their, their, their salute to, their, um, to Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and Kanai Chatterjee and Charu Majumdar uh, in one of their camps there. Is this mic actually on? I'm not sure it is. It is. Okay. Uh. So these Naxalite rebels, they have haunted and taunted the Indian state for the last 50 years. But the foot soldiers of, the, of their People's Liberation guerrilla army now come mainly from India's tribal communities, who are popularly called Adivasis, and they make up 8.6% of the total population of India, accounting for more than 100 million people. Considered lowly, savage, and wild by the dominant classes and castes around them, for centuries, Adivasis were left on the margins of Indian society. They'd survived in the jungles by cultivating whatever little land they had, living off forest resources by hunting and gathering fruits and flowers, and chopping wood to build their houses, fuel their hearths, and make their digging sticks with. Able to reproduce themselves through resources around them without much dependence on the rest of Indian society, many Adivasi communities developed social values and countercultures that were remarkably egalitarian and ecologically sound in comparison to Indian's domin India's dominant castes and classes. Today, increasingly squeezed out of their forest homes by the state and corporations, they migrate for a few months of far away from their homes to the construction sites and factories of the towns and the cities, where they use for the most grueling, backbreaking, and hazardous work, providing the cheap labor fueling the Indian economic boom. The Adivasi foot soldiers were often fighting for very different reasons from the abstract ideals of leaders like Gyanji. On a wider level, theirs is a struggle for tribal autonomy against a state they see as repressive, brutal, and prejudiced. But for any individual Adivasi, their reasons for joining the Maoists were often much more personal. Take, for example, Kohli, a gentle, sensitive, 16-year-old Adivasi <coughs> youth with radiant dark skin and a coy smile, whose rifle was nearly as tall as himself and who insisted on carrying my bags when he was assigned as my bodyguard. He had run away to live with the guerrillas after a trivial fight with his father about a glass of spilt milk, literally spilt milk, while working in his tea shop. Rather than breaking with their pasts, as Gyanji did, the Adivasi youth found in the guerrilla armies a home away from home, and often moved in and out of them as though they were visiting an uncle or an aunt. To the government, however, both Gyanji and Kohli are simply terrorists, a dangerous cancer that must be eradicated. The insurgents have blown up security forces, derailed trains that defy their economic blockades, killed people they deem are police informers, and delivered summary justice in their people's courts. Reproducing these incidents, news bans reading latest terrorist attacks appear regu regularly across Indian national TV channels, creating a climate of fear among the Indian middle classes for whom large sections of rural central and eastern India are no-go zones. Last year, Home Minister Rajnath Singh promised the final battle against the Naxalites to be fought to the, fi fought to the finish and won. He said, we need to bring aggression into our policy, aggression in thinking, aggression in strategy, aggression in deployment of forces, aggression in operations, aggression in development, and aggression in road construction. The latest Indian government campaigns against these rebels began over a decade ago. So these were the natural affected areas at the time when I did my research. This is based on a, on a security um, South Asia terrorist portal um, data. <clears throat> in, in 2006, um, the then Prime Minister Mon Mohan Singh had declared the Maoist the gravest single internal security threat facing the country and had labeled them terrorists. 
And this signaled a new wave of security operation to hunt down the Maoists and to silence their sympathizers and supporters. A red corridor was painted right from Nepal up in the north down to uh, Andhra Pradesh in the south. And the intelligence agencies at the time claimed that over 40% of India's land area was affected and this included 20 of, 20 of India's 28 states, 223 of its 640 districts. These numbers are, of course, really hard to verify and were possibly inflated to justify an increase in security and defense budgets. More than 100,000 soldiers were dispatched to surround the Maoist guerrilla strongholds in the center and the east of the country. They were accompanied by a squadron of helicopters, special force teams which, with names like Cobra, Jharkhand Jaguar, Greyhounds, who were trained in jungle warfare schools to fight the guerrillas with their own tactics. In some areas, such as the Dandakaranya region of southern Chhattisgarh, local youth were armed and mobilized to cleanse the area of people in what was called Salvajudam, meaning purification hunt in the local Gondi language. Entire villages were plundered, hundreds of women raped, others mutilated, murdered, and according to human rights activists, more than 350,000 people were forced to leave their homes, many forcibly evacuated into resettlement camps, which were like prison compounds. This is actually a Getty image taken from, um, <clears throat> uh, from, from uh, an area near to Chattis the Chhattisgarh zones, and you can see you know, the ways in which um, Adivasis are being carried out, treated like carrion, well, as ca uh, treated like animals. Um, these, um, the other two are pictures that I took. One was in, um, one was in the village where I lived, where the Maoists were um, uh, occupying, uh, where the security forces, when they climbed into the hills, were occupying. Uh, schools and health centers, and this was a disused health center which the Maoists blew up at the, at the uh, once the once the security forces had occupied it. Um, and then here are kind of surrender posters, so you know handsome kind of packages being granted to people who surrender. Human rights activists have claimed that behind the state's desire to destroy the Naxalites and civilize the Adivasis is actually the aim of cleansing the region for the extraction of minerals. Now, under the Adivasi forests in the states of Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Odisha, Andhra Pradesh, and Telangana lie some of India's most lucrative reserves of coal, iron ore, bauxite, copper, manganese, mica, and there's more. Um, here are some pictures. These are actually taken from um, Itai Noise field site. Itai, I believe, is in the in in, in the audience. So in a different part of Jharkhand, um, this is um, coal. Uh, these are coal peddlers. And this is a coal mining area. Business analysts have claimed that Indian mining is a success story in waiting, and powerful corporations have signed deals to exploit the resources and to acquire land for mining operations steel factories, power plants, um, Mittal, SR, Portsco, Vedanta, uh, you name them, they're all scouting out the landscape. But there are historic laws uh, which the Adivasis fought for in colonial times, which actually prevent the land from being easily sold to non-Adivasis, to outsiders, so that Adivasis and the Naxalites who live among them stand squarely in the way of India's economic boom. In the villages where I lived among the guerrillas, the security forces search and destroy missions generated terror. Those who could fled to neighboring villages as the patrols mounted the hills. Villages had been used as human shields by the security forces and as informers to find the Maoists. Others had been caught in the crossfire and brutally beaten by soldiers during raids uh, accused of harboring the rebels. And like the Vietnam War, general boasts of better kill ratios to the media. In the last decade, according to the South Asia Terrorist Portal, almost 7,000 people have been killed, of which 40% have been civilians, 34% Maoists, and 26% security forces. Of course, we don't know uh, how many civilians were killed by which side. The government has pledged many times in the past to destroy the Maoists, and yet they endure. Every year in November, across the forests that are their strongholds, they celebrate the deceased in Martyrs Week. 
these meetings of gorillas in the forests lined with prep paper, paper bunting and memorials draped in red cloth are ephemeral, ephemeral as all traces of their presence must be erased to evade the security forces. Nevertheless, they fly their red flags high, painted with a hammer and a sickle, sing the Socialist Internationale, and in remembering the thousands that have been killed, they seek to regenerate life in the revolutionary spirit from the dead. So that's um, actually um, a martyr's memorial on, on the left-hand side of the Maoists, and these are these martyr's memorial cre created by the security forces in Sukma in Chhattisgarh. Um, where 74 um, uh, Indian soldiers uh, were killed a few years ago. But these um, traditions uh, of the Maoists go back to their origins. The, they actually first made their mark on the Indian countryside in May 1967, when a small uprising in the foothills of the Himalayas uh, took place in the West Bengal village of Naxalbari, from which they get their name. There, peasants and laborers occupied land, reclaimed it as theirs, demanded that landlords cancel all their debts and end intergenerational bondage. And um, at the time, the Chinese Communist Party declared um, the Naxalbari events widely on Peking radio and announced that a, a red revolutionary area was being established in India. A peal of spring thunder has crashed over India, they said. But within a few months, the upper was brutally crushed by the police and many of the leaders were killed or imprisoned. Nevertheless, in the years that followed, the embers of the rebellion ignited sparks um, of, uh, of re resistance in other parts of the country, in Srikakulam, in Andhra Pradesh, in Koraput, in Orissa, in the plains of Bhojpur, in Bihar, in Birbhum, in West Bengal. The leaders of these rebellions formed different revolutionary parties and claimed that India needed the strategy that Mao Zedong had used against the Japanese in the 1930s when the conditions in India were also, they claimed, semi-colonial and semi-feudal. Sorry, when the conditions in China were also semi-colonial and semi-feudal, so they were taking over those, that strategy uh, for India. And they began uh, a protected people's war, mobilizing peasants to establish rural bases and eventually encircling the cities, that was the plan, to capture state power in the fight for a global communist society. Now, drawn by the romance of the movement, many bright urban youth from upper and middle class and class families renounced the comforts of their homes and their university classrooms to work with the poor. Gyanji, who once meditated along, um, alone for his nirvana on the banks of the Ganges, found kindred spirits amongst teachers and fellow students. They discussed and debated how to bring heaven on earth and create a communist society. They linked hands with the protests against the Vietnam War, the uprisings in Paris, the rise of the American Black Panthers, and they distributed pamphlets on the death of God. Fired by the passions of those who had taken to the streets and challenged the injustices of, the gov of governments in faraway places, moved by the poverty and oppression in the slums around them, they were disenchanted by the corruption of party politics and the failures of the Indian state to address inequality. The agricultural plains of Bihar, where Gyanji initially worked in the late 80s, became known as India's flaming fields due to the fierce caste wars fought between the Naxalites, their supporters, and the dominant caste landlords. One of the poorest areas of India, the region was marked by great disparities. So these are the plains um, of India uh, where there were high caste landlords who controlled large swathes of land and smaller farmers and especially landless Dalits who worked for the landowners and were considered untouchables. The Naxalites tried to infiltrate the Dalit households to free them from their servitude. They selectively clicked selectively killed the most oppressive landlords, chased others away to the cities, seized their land and redistributed it amongst the landless and small farmers. They organized rallies, protests and labor strikes demanding wage rises, elimination of bonded labor, more equitable terms of sharecropping and they publicly beat men who harassed women. Uh, and they descended en masse into government offices demanding clean water, better housing, healthcare provision. 
But in the 1990s, uh, the state repression increased, and the high caste landlords retaliated against the Naxalites and their supporters by forming, their pri forming private armies or militias, which met, went by all kinds of names like Ranvir Sena, Bhumi Sena, Sunlight Sena. These Senas, which were armies, came with their own war cry. There is only one remedy for the Naxalites, cut them six inches shorter. Dalits, in particular, were massacred overnight. They were often decapitated as, their slo as a slogan promised to make them six inch inches shorter. Men, women, and children were killed, eight one night, nine another, 22 another, 25, 35, and so the growing, growing slaughter continued as the police watched on. The Naxalite uh, supporters' houses were razed to the ground. There was nowhere to hide. So the guerrillas could no longer take shelter uh, in the mud houses, and the rice fields provided shelter only when the crop was tall. So in the late 80s, they read their Mao and She, and um, they, they hoped to find India's Yenan, and they went in search of actually better geographical terrain for guerrilla warfare. And they began to retreat into central and eastern India, into the forests and hills there, into what are now the states of Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, uh, Telangana, Southern Orissa, Northern Andhra Pradesh, Southeastern Maharashtra, and also parts of West Bengal. At the time, the Naxalites, who came from the cities and had experience mainly of the plains, knew very little about the tribal people that dominated these forested highlands, the communities of Uraus, Mundas, Hors, Paharias, Gons, Birhors, Koryas, and many other Adivasi groups. Though the modern state, through the British East India Company, followed by the Indian government under the crown, and then the independent Indian government had penetrated the area, it was mainly for taxation and for the exploitation of the forests for military purposes. So railway sleepers, uh, both in India, also here, and furniture, uh, for instance, were taken out of those forests. For the Adivasis, the state was the policeman who beat you, officials who cordoned off your forest and let outsiders steal your timber, and soldiers who drove you like animals. The term used for Adivasis by many officers was jungly, savage. When the Naxalites arrived, addressing local grievances, they chased away the forest and police officials, set up mobile health camps, and gained credibility amongst the locals. Although the Naxalites were as foreign to the Adivasis as the officials, they treated the Adivasis with respect and dignity, gaining a legitimacy and an intimacy with local communities, establishing kinship links between the guerrilla armies and the villages, making it easy over time for youth like Kohli to move back and forth. So by the time I lived in the guerrilla strongholds, almost every Adivasi house had or knew someone who was involved as an armed carder, worker, or sympathizer, and the Maoists were called the jungle sarkar, the forest state. In the six years since I left, the South Asia terrorist terrorism portal claims that over 6,000 people have surrendered and more than 5,000 arrested. The government has offered handsome monetary packages up to uh, 1.5 to 2.5 lakh, 1,700 to 2,800 pounds and more for weapons, depending on the seniority of the Naxalite and the rifles with which he or she surrenders. But scholars, lawyers, and human rights activists have said that many of these surrenders are fake, that Adivasis are being coerced. This is a new dimension to a long history of fake incidents. Rebels have been presented as killed in battle when they actually died under police torture. Verification of events is tough. The few brave independent reporters, human rights lawyers, and activists uh, enter, entering the affected regions have been chased out. So um, I crossed paths with the guerrillas when, towards the end of my doctoral field research in 1999 to 2002, they started to enter the Munda Adivasi village where I was living then. So these are the two um, villages where I've lived. So the, the first, that on the on the left hand side is the um, is the Munda village where I lived um, uh, in, in between 99 and 2002, and that I've kept going back to since. And then this is. This is the new, um, the, the, the area I worked in much more recently. So these are the, the hills that mark the, the Naxlite terrain. Um, this was an, uh, an Urao um, house that I lived in then. 
At the time, I saw them um, when they were first coming into my doctoral field, field site as protection racketeers, not unlike the Sicilian Mafia. They were extorting money from state development schemes, big business in return for safeguarding them, safeguarding against their own violence. But as I followed their progress from London, I was intrigued by the fact that so many Adivasis were joining the Maoists, and I felt compelled to understand why. I knew I had to return to Jharkhand to conduct ethnographic research, that hallmark praxis of social anthropology, participant observation, deep immersion over a long period of time, at least a year or more, into the lives of people who are initially strangers, learning their language, seeking to know and experience the world through their perspectives and actions in as holistic a manner as possible. Undertaking such long-term, open-ended field research seemed crucial in order to move beyond the cursory impressions based on interviews or a few or a visit of a few days that had begun to emerge of the Maoists. Staying with the Adivasi communities in a guerrilla stronghold seemed the obvious way to arrive at a more nuanced understanding of their predicament than those that had often em emerged in comparable contexts, whether in Vietnam, in the Vietnam War or Peru's Shining Path insurrection, which argued that people were either stuck between two armies, coerced into revolutionary support, or turned to the guerrillas because of either some utilitarian benefits or long-standing grievances they addressed. But it was not until 2008, coincidentally, as the latest round of counterinsurgency campaigns were launched, that I was able to finally return to Jharkhand. I had gone with very modest um, ambitions. I wanted to spend time among the Adivasis to understand how life had changed for them in the face of this revolutionary movement, allegedly fighting for a more equal society. I never expected to see a guerrilla, let alone meet one. But I had ended up living in what the Naxalites considered their red capital, one of the two guerrilla strongholds in India. And as the state's counterinsurgency operations escalated, outsiders were prohibited from entering the guerrilla areas unless accompanied by the security forces. Those who dared to venture in without informing the authorities rarely stayed more than a few hours, at the most a few days. As the situation became increasingly dangerous, I considered returning to London, but the stories of the people I had met in the Red Capital had already pulled me too far into this little known world. So Night March, which is the name uh, of the book, refers to an unexpected seven-night trek uh, with a Naxite guerrilla platoon that I undertook in 2010 at the end of this research, alongside these new uh, counterinsurgency operations. Um, as the only woman and the only combatant, I set out with a group of five, only non-combatant. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I set out with this group of fighters um, under the cover of darkness to walk 250 kilometers from one part of India in the state of Bihar to another back in Jharkhand, the areas where I lived. And unraveling across this march, the book actually uh, it draws on the four and a half years of uh, I have lived as an anthropologist amongst India's Adivasis, uh, with one long spell outside the guerrilla zones and one long spell inside. Night March is then the, my journey into this underbelly of the subcontinent to understand why behind the mask of shining, the shining new India, some of the country's poor have shunned the world's largest democracy and united with revolutionary ideologues to take up arms against rising inequality. So I focus on both um, the perspectives of the revolutionary ideologues and the poor Adivasi communities who were joining them. Uh, so at the heart of Night March are the nuances, complexities, and ironies of the protracted encounter between the guerrilla leaders and their foot soldiers. So the book actually tells the story of vastly different people, um, very different people um, and that I met along the way, and how they came together to take up arms to change the world, and how they fell apart, their dreams also turning into nightmares. So there is, for instance, Gyanji, who I mentioned earlier, the high caste intellectual from a well-to-do family who has been underground for more than 20 years. Kohli, the 16-year-old Adivasi foot soldier who fleets in and out of the guerrilla armies as though he were going to stay with an uncle or an aunt. Uh, another central character is Vikas, the Adivasi youth who betrays the guerrilla, forming a gang to destroy them. And there's Somvari, the Adivasi woman I lived with, uh, who grows to resent the guerrillas. 
So through these characters and my journey with them, Night March, sh Night March shows how amidst proliferating contradictions, revolutionary motivations are sustained and subverted at the same time against the backdrop of exploitation, inequality and injustice, which is at the heart of contemporary India. I'll just highlight some of the kind of wider analysis which emerges through these stories, which is um, in place, you know, which, 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 un un which the book unveils over the course of the journey. So, um, so the spread and collapse um, of uh, these insurgencies. So this, so this was a, I didn't take many pictures on the march, but this was one of them. Um, so this is everyday life in the in the in the guerrilla movement. Um, this is in the area where I was conducting research at football matches that they organised, uh, paintings of their flags. You know, reading newspapers. Many Adivasis grew to learn, grew up learning to read and write in the guerrilla armies. Um, the spread and collapse of such insurgencies is usually explained in terms of ordinary people, as I mentioned earlier, between either being caught between the state and the rebels, stuck between two armies, or joining the rebel cause because of the utilitarian benefits they provide, so that's greed, or because of genuine problems uh, that the people face, which they address, so grievance. Night March uh, argues that these explanations are partial at best. Instead, the book shows the significance of the development of emotional intimacy, family and kinship networks between the rebel armies and the villagers, which both enabled the spread of the insurgents and also became their Achilles heel, undermining their activities. The next slides came in as dominant caste outsiders, but their ideological commitment to an egalitarian society, a casteless and classless one, translated into their humane treatment of those they encountered with dignity as equal human beings. So communism wasn't simply a utopian dream of a future society, but influenced the remaking of revolutionary subjects and the restructuring of social relations in areas that the party held sway. An enormous effort went into superseding and negating the specificities of caste and class divisions between those who encountered the revolutionaries. So it is this that uh, encouraged the development of relations of intimacy between the Naxalites and the Adivasis. There are several other uh, subsidiary arguments, which are, I'll just run through a few of them. So revolutionary communists in India are comparable to its religious renouncers. The one seeks personal emancipation, that is the religious ascetic, and the other works for communal freedom. The revolutionary both have renounced the world around them, broken with their pasts, and sacrificed everything, including themselves, to fight for their ideals of human emancipation. And you can see this very clearly in the trajectory of some people like Gyanji, who was once on the path of, of re renunciation uh, to nirvana and who then became an Axite revolutionary. Um, another argument is that the Naxalites uh, leaders have dogmatically insisted on an outdated analysis of the Indian economy, arguing it is semi-feudal. And this analysis has acquired almost an untouchable status of some kind of transcendental purity within the movement, which has become like a religious mantra. And though it may explain why a core group of leaders stick together or have stuck together against all odds, it has already also created several problems for their aims of social transformation. Transformation. So namely, they aren't able to take full account of the way in which capitalism and its values have spread everywhere in the country, including in their own armies, creating renegades. And they aren't able to develop and utilize also the, the already existing egalitarian values that exist amongst the Adivasi villages. They are spreading amidst and are in fact leading to the, the demise of those values. Um, uh, another issue that emerges is that mobili mobilizing people to fight against inequality and injustice may require the use of arms, but violence re resistance attacks, attracts, in this case, the violence of state repression. And the danger is that in mastering the art and discipline of guns, that becomes the focus of the humanitarian struggle, overriding and thus destroying efforts to mobilize people towards new, more egalitarian and just ideals and communities. The most sophisticated explanations of the appeal of the Naxalites have suggested that they are the 
combined outcome of the steady democratization of the political process in India and the failure of its developmental reach. So as the state has become more and more available to people who are kept on its margins and more of India's marginalized people have participated in its democratic process, democratic aspirations have flourished. At the same time, though, the failure of Indian democracy to give adequate, adequate space in which a public sense of purpose can be articulated has left vast sections of uh, society disenchanted, and their resulting grievances have made them turn to the next slides. That's how, how it goes. Night March, however, concludes that the opposite is, in fact, like, as likely to be true. That is that the movement fighting, this movement fighting against the character of Indian democracy has actually expanded its reach amongst people who have previously been left on the margins of the state, alienated from it. So by fighting for their human rights on an equal footing with dominant and higher castes and classes, the Naxalites have actually nurtured Dalits and Adivasis who will ultimately seek not a withering away of the state that is a revolutionary ideal, but would also want a share of the state as a part of it. So communist struggles... Um, to create casteless, classless communities where women will be equal to men, uh, but they're often, more, most often led by men from elite backgrounds. So in their challenge to the structural inequalities of society, they too often neglect the incipient inequalities within. In India, the result may be that a Maoist-inspired Naxalite struggle for a communist society will actually have given rise to an emboldened Dalit, Adivasi, and women's movements demanding their rights to be treated on equal terms as the dominant classes and castes, seeking a greater share of space within Indian democracy, keeping alive a dream for a better, more equal world. Perhaps then, one of the furthest reaching consequences of the Naxalites might have been as a democratizing force in India, catalyzing those who want to fight for a more equal world, who are mobilized by the spirit of the revolutionary struggle, even if they have been, at the same time, dis disappointed and disenchanted um, by, by its practice. Um, yeah, is that... Uh, yeah. Okay, um... I've got five minutes. I, I, I don't know um, uh, if you'd like. I, I'd like to give you a small flavor of the march, uh, if there's time, time for that. Um, uh, which, so, so, so the book is framed around this march, um, which is in a way a, also a narrative device to actually speak to the broader issues and also to introduce you and for you to meet the characters. So, um, yeah, maybe I'll end with the end of the march when I was awoken for the roll call at 10 p.m. Gyanji assured me that this really was the last leg of the journey. We would not walk for much more than four hours across the plains. We would be in the safety of the forest, not far from Laogaon. That's where I lived. One foot, one foot in front of the other. We had been walking by this time for about um, uh, six. This was, a, this was the seventh night. There was a sudden jerk in my neck, um, uh, and the weight of my head had collapsed onto my chest. I realized I had dozed off while walking and awoke with a jolt. My eyelids were heavy, and I struggled to keep my eyes open as we marched on. My neck jerked again and then again. Sleepwalking is what the gorillas called it. They could all do it. I used to laugh in disbelief when they told me about it in the months before, not once imagining that I would share their lives to such an extent that I would find myself walking in my sleep as they did. I had never experienced it before. My head seemed to empty of all consciousness and awareness moved to my feet, which continued to put themselves one in front of the other with mechanical regularity. They intuitively appeared to sense the unevenness of the ground beneath them without recourse to the eyes or the brain. Four hours later, it was obvious that something was wrong. We ought, we ought to have been surrounded by the forest then. Gyanji had been uneasy for most of the previous hours. It became clear that we were not on the route they normally took through this area. Four hours later, so there, there, there were now more than two, two Central Reserve Police Force camps um, with at least a 1,000 men of security forces stationed in these plains all trained as commandos in counter-terrorism and jungle warfare tactics. They were there to conduct domination exercise to, exercises to sanitize the area and get rid of the guerrillas. Vikas was leading us. He kept running back when Gyanji beckoned him, bringing assurances that everything was under control and that the pilots up ahead were on the right track. But clearly something was amiss. 
I was very annoyed with Gyanji. He said, seemed to be taking too lenient an attitude towards Vikas. Did Vikas know where he was going? Was he deliberately leading us astray? Wasn't this exactly how ambushes were set up? We seem to be sitting ducks. Parastu is another leader. Meanwhile, seemed oblivious to my concerns about Vikas. My noticing my struggle to keep up, he suggested that I should ride the horse. There was this horse that joined us on the last trek, last night. I tried to protest, afraid to lose control of my mobility to an animal, but he insisted. I was too tired to hold my ground. In any case, I wasn't sure I was the best judge of what was good for me at that stage, and so I gave in. The saddle was a pile of blankets, and the stirrups were two loopholes knotted in a jute rope. It was far from comfortable, comfortable, but lolling up and down on the animal certainly kept me awake. An ear-splitting bang resounded through the landscape. The horse bolted away from the line. With my heart in my mouth, I dug my calves into its side and tugged ineffectually at the reins for a few seconds and then wrapped my arms around the horse's neck, neck hanging on for dear life. Just as I was about to free my feet, feet of the stirrups, there was another boom. Coley ran to my side, grabbed the reins, and brought the spooked horse to a halt before helping me dismount. Run, people were shouting. Coley said, let's go, Didi. And so I ran, trying to keep up with him. Earlier on in the night, when I had been constantly on the brink of falling asleep as I had walked, I wouldn't have believed that I was capable of running at all. I hadn't known that when you think you have a gang of armed men after you, find the strength to run. I was half sick with fright. I passed others who had stopped in their tracks to fling themselves onto the ground and crouch down behind the rice buns. Some of them appeared to be crawling on their bellies towards what looked like the contour contours of reeds. I wondered whether I, whether I should follow suit. I couldn't keep up with Coley, and he disappeared from my sight. Then I heard the voices of North Indian soldiers, and although I didn't know if they were imagined or real, and although I didn't know where I was going, it galvanized me into running faster. Everyone back in line, I heard Gyanji and then Parasji shouting, Stop running, calm down, don't disperse. Parasji's voice rang through the air. They said it was only a shotgun, probably a hunter in the jungle, or someone just practicing their shooting. The Indian security forces, they assured us, would not be out now. I stopped running. Gorillas emerged from all sides like ghosts. A company line formed again. But after the recent panic, the line kept breaking. It seemed that everyone's nerves were frayed. Soldiers were huddled together, and the spaces between the groups kept, groups kept increasing. It was hard to keep 80 people together, and we soon became a ragtag bunch of misfits roaming the landscape. Gyanji was in despair, as, as he said we were lo losing discipline when we needed it the most. It was as though the gun had shot through everyone's confidence in the guerrilla army. I never discovered what the gunshot was, but I grew increasingly frustrated with Gyanji for not taking Vikas to task and for not taking on the responsibility to lead the guerrilla company himself. So many lives were at stake now. How however, I was too shaken to speak and form focused my energies back on placing my feet one feet in front of the, foot in front of the other. It must have been five o'clock in the morning when we entered a patch of forest. We were to rest there for no more than 10 minutes. Yet bags were thrown on the ground. People collapsed onto whatever clearing was closest to them. There was no attempt to keep any kind of military formation. Within minutes, it looked like most of the 80-odd crew was fast asleep. I wondered how people could sleep under such stress stressful conditions. I sat beside Gyanji, fully aware that he was aghast that everyone had just dropped off to sleep. I knew that having stopped, everyone would now find it extremely hard to start walking again. With such exhaustion, it was more important than ever to keep the rhythm of the march going. I said to myself that under no circumstances must I allow my eyes to close, although my eyelids were like a lead weight that wouldn't stop sinking. I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Alpha. Um, that's an incredible story. Um, I should just say that um, copies of the book are on sale outside uh, for £10. That's half price. Um, and they also take card, in case you don't have cash, um, just so you know. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and now we'll hear from Kaya. OK. Uh, Thanks, Faisy, for the um, for the invitation to speak, and thank you, Alpha, for a, a fascinating um, 
book and, and presentation. Um, it's a it's a real pleasure to be here today to to um, to discuss Night March um, with you. Um, for those who haven't had a chance to read the book yet, um, it is uh, an extraordinary book that um, you know straddles various genres and um, you know throughout there is a, a sort of a, a almost like a quest structure that keeps the narrative going plus um, a kind of social portraiture um, that uh, you know each part of the book gives you um, you know both this incredible story about the the night march plus um, you know unlike other f works of creative nonfiction or long form journalism. Um, spans various disciplinary categories of history, economics, politics, moral and existential philosophy, um, and sociology. So the, the method is to both illustrate and illuminate these dramatic tensions that encapsulate the very social contradictions um, and a, a, I think a real mastery of imagery to capture um, complex ideas. So the night march itself becomes a metaphor for the persistence of Maoism in India and Maoism itself a symptom of Indian society. Um, and for me what really set apart um, night march from uh, other uh, writings about um, these question was the the moral dimension uh, that's that's very strong throughout, and um, one of the strengths of this participant ob observation is that it enables critical sympathy, and um, you know crucially, Alpha has moved between different perspectives in her work, which you which you um, discussed and. Um, and there's a, a recognition in the book too that there are perspectives that are excluded by any one study. Um, and I think it's quite an achievement that, you know, what we get so much is on the one hand sort of condemnation of, of these um, movements, but then also on the other hand a sort of romanticism and what Alpha gives us quite refreshingly is a critical analysis as she says of the experience, visions and actions of these people recording not only what the mouse say but what they do um, and demystifies, de demystifying Maoism is especially important at the current moment when they are being demonized and instrumentalized by the Indian state. So this book helps us to understand what is at stake when we hear of Maoist atrocities being reported or organizations being vilified and civil society activists in India being incarcerated for being quote unquote urban Naxals. So in terms of um, Alpha's ethnographic study, um, you know, you get this attention to the micro level of Indian politics and this shows us the various modes of power which we, the Maoists have been building. Um, you know, if, you know, there is the aspect of coercion, of course, and corruption and consent if we think of these as sort of three modalities of, of power in general. Um, so, along with that kind of nuanced, fine-grained analysis of the appearance and reality of quote-unquote corruption, the way, you know, and if we define corruption sort of as the ways in which public goods are channeled for private gain, but showing sort of the flip side that, you know, private gain is also being redistributed um, in, in some of these cases. Um, I mean, for me, some of the most fascinating details in Nar Night March are about Maoist efforts to build hegemony. Um, and, you know, this, this um, photo of the sort of football tournaments and, um, 
there, there's some mention of, of Malice working to create a written script for Gond in Chathiskar, and those, I, I'd be very interested to hear more about that in the, the discussion, because that, that was, um, I think that, that kind of thing is not uh, generally part of the discussion about, about Maoism in India. Um, so one of the major achievements of this book is also that the macro level of the Indian economy and state is also in view. Um, and it's, and I, th I think it's worth saying, especially when, you know, the, the Maoists here are, you know, purporting to challenge the state or in some cases supplant the state. Well, what is the reality of the, the Indian state? And that, that geography of uneven and combined development is, is very clear throughout the, the narrative. Um, and of course, these features have been amplified under neoliberal competition and fragmentation of these subnational states. Um, we not there's there's a point where the platoon I think comes across a um, a convoy of of lorries with I think iron slurry on it, and it's a it's a really interesting. Uh, image in terms of talking about or, or, th or thinking about this kind of fragmentation. We, we, so we, through this kind of narrative device, we learn about iron mining in Chhattisgarh, but that the ore goes on to be pelletized in Andhra Pradesh and then made into steel in, in Gujarat. Um, and, and that this mining development that displaces the Adivasis rather than employing them as, say, unskilled workers as it might have in the past, um, that we, we see this sort of overview of the kind of um, the reality of sort of informal, precarious, seasonal work and migration on the one hand and accumulation by dispossession on the other hand. And um, I came across a startling figure, actually, um, that since uh, independence in India, uh, development projects have displaced between 20 million and 60 million people. Um, so that's, that's something worth thinking about in terms of the context of this book. Um, and so, that's sort of like an overview of the, the contours of the, the Indian state. I think one thing I'd like to comment on, and I'd be interested in picking this up in the discussion, is um, the, the a couple of the states that are part of this kind of um, red corridor, or, or had been a part of the red corridor, in fact, were um, created as quote unquote tribal states. So in 2000, um, uh, statehood was granted to Jhar Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh by the, I think, then ruling BJP. Um, and in fact, the politics of these states were, have been quite sordid, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and surely is a part of the, an explanation of the prevalence of Maoism in them. So, um, and, you know, we should keep in mind that um, sort of Maoism is not the only form of armed struggle in, in India. It's, uh, you know, we also have separatist movements and, and fundamentalist movements. Um, so interestingly, um, you know, the region in West Bengal where Naxalism takes its name, you know, is uh, since about the, I guess, the 80s and 90s also been a sort of stronghold of, um, of separatist movements of um, uh, Rajbanshi and Gurkha separatists um, who have their own armed contingents. Um, so what I'd like to do in sort of my commentary is just take a look at the concrete features of, of, of Indian democracies or the failures of in Indian democracy, the kind of, um, I guess, opportunism that is um, also a, a major feature of party politics there. So um, 
you know, where the book provides this kind of macro and micro level, I think my comments I'd like to um, uh, comment on the, the middle level or meso level of, of, of party politics. So at, at one point in Night March, um, a young Maoist called Bursa, uh, maybe, maybe, I should maybe just read the, the passage, um, has spent some time in jail. And this is a part of a discussion of sort of the kind of, I guess, co contradictions and co sort of corrupting um, f features of, of um, of um, the, the sort of compromises that that um, that, um, that being involved with the Naxalites, you know, mean for some Adivasi youth. So um, Bursa is, comes out of jail and um, decides that to earn a decent living or gain power, he began considering pitching behind a member of the Legislative Assembly for whom his older brother worked in the hope that he could one day mobilize enough support to fight for a seat himself. And I found that a very interesting passage because the subtext was that this is just a, a, a politics was a route to just lining his pockets or this was another kind of form of um, corruption and um, so I think it, it's worth sort of um, looking at the sort of alienation from from party pol politics or why this might be the case in in this situation so um, you know in I guess even amongst the left in India sort of criticisms of the malice can fall into a few broad categories um, you know, on the one hand, their sort of high-handedness, that they put their supporters in the line of the state's fire, that support is often under duress, but also that they're sectarian and closed off from others with different viewpoints. And I think the book does a very good job of sort of fleshing out some of these criticisms and complicating them. But um, the, the sort of sectarian divides amongst sort of uh, progressive forces in, in Indian politics is something I've wanted to sort of spend a little bit more time on. Um, and here I think it's worth historicizing and surveying some of the underlying experiences that shape what is, I think, you know, certainly one of the major fault lines of the Maoist movement. So. I guess what sets Indian Maoists apart from other guerrilla movements elsewhere in the world is India is one of the few countries in the world where communist parties, um, not only in their sort of Maoist forms, but in their sort of Stalinist variations, are a significant political force um, or, you know, have a, still have a major presence, uh, you know, um, the largest and most influential is the Communist Party of India Marxist, or CPM, um, which has a presence in the south of India, primarily Kerala, but also Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. Um, but its main stronghold uh, is still in the east, uh, West Bengal, and the small state of Tripura. And, you know, the, the CPM was among the first and had been one of the longest running democratically elected communist parties in, in power. So, um, given the degree to which India's society and economy is so polarized and which Alpha was speaking about as being one of the fuels of the kind of explosive um, kind of violence and contradictions of the mass movement, um, left-wing politics itself has kind of been pushed into these very two d different directions. So you have uh, kind of a Stalinist left which is committed to liberal electoral politics and Maoism, which has been the pr principal sort of defenders of the poorest and deprived and have concerned themselves with, you know, agrarian distress. So 
At the end of Night March, there's a very uh, helpful overview of the different kinds of representations and studies of Maoism. And um, in one particular, you know, this idea of the, the tr um, tribals being caught between two armies, um, that of the state security forces and the Maoists, the, I, this, this thesis does seem to be promoted uh, mostly by, the, by Indian communist intellectuals. And um, these same communist parties can trace their origins to a history of peasant revolt. Um, particularly in what is now the state of West Bengal and, and Andhra Pradesh, um, you know, where the modern day Maoists often sort of trace their origins and have their sort of strongholds. Um, so, uh, in what follows, I'd just like to talk about some of the formative moments of Maoist history, some of which Alpha has uh, described, but um, putting it into the context of the, their relationship to parliamentary parties. So it was in 1967 uh, when um, after the West Bengal State Assembly elections that the CPM won 18% of the vote and entered a governing coalition as a junior partner um, with a, sort of a breakaway of the Congress party at the time. Uh, and it was the CPM's Jyoti Bashu be, who became West Bengal's deputy chief minister at the time, while um, Hare Krishna Konar was the land minister. Um, and sh very shortly after they were, you know, elected in this, you know, historical kind of uh, moment, it was that May that a peasant rebellion erupted in the village of Nakshalbari in. Darjeeling district, and it was in fact led by the CPM's Peasant Front. Uh, and um, Konar himself attempted to mediate and try to get the peasants to put down their arms. And in the end, the chief minister dispatched, um, the sort of Congress chief minister, dispatched security forces to repress the uprising, which was crushed with extreme brutality over the succeeding months. And the CPM's leadership continued to participate in the, that government, the United Front government, that was undertaking state reprisal against a section of its own base. So this is what led to the split in the party. The CPM then split, and um, that's where the CPI Marxist-Leninists, so the kind of the original Naxalites, that's when they were formed, and they pledged a guerrilla strategy in the countryside uh, along the sort of Maoist lines that Alpa um, describes. And Naxalbari was a watershed for the CPM, and it led to a virulent campaign against left adventurists, and it, you know, it degenerated into sort of fratricidal armed conflict on, on both sides. Um, so, but at the same time, you know, in later years, determined to avoid a second Nakshalbari, the CPM pushed for a, re a real degree of land reform. Um, Konar's strategy was to combine mass mobilizations with land re redistribution measures already mandated by state law. So agricultural workers, sharecroppers, and small farmers were called upon to identify land belonging to absentee owners um, or holdings that were sort of uh, in illegal excess of sort of land ceilings. And it, you know, it involved people on the ground in this um, very like enthusiastic upsurge of um, and that was a, a, a major way that the CPM was able to build its cater in the countryside and dislodge the dominant Congress support, supporting elite. So they, you know, they were in a sense forced to um, mobilize poor and landless peasants to seize the land. Um, and you know, at the same time, so in the early 70s, peasant insurrections were erupting in the countryside, um, led by the Maoist CPIML, um, while the 
And this is also happening in the context of um, martial law being imposed in East Pakistan. And the, I think the Maoists at the time were working across the border. And, um, you know, this certainly, I think, raised questions of some kind of communist unity between the two sides of, of Bengal that had been split during partition. Um, the Congress government in New Delhi in the early 70s dispatched the Indian army to crush insurrectionary forces on both sides of the border. Um, and the CPM was caught in the blowback of state repression while at the same time mounting a further factocidal assault on the Naxalites. Uh, under Chief Minister um, Shiddhartha Shankar a reign of terror was unleashed against the CPM and CPIML, or Maoist militants, alike. Um, and, you know, trade unionists, peasant organizers, and radical students were also caught up in this. By 1973, there were nearly 18,000 political prisoners in West Bengal jails. So this is two years before the emergency. So, arguably, the CPM's original baptism of fire in office was its effort to crush Naxalism under the 1960s United Front. So this formative experience was not of mobilization but repression of a rural movement. And this generated a certain pride in its toughness against sort of ultra-left adventurism. Um, and it was, you know, nearly 40 years later that this kind of, I don't know, um, that, that we could see this, this being the, this, the coming to haunt them and, and that they were eventually ousted from power in West Bengal in 2011 uh, because it was CBM Cater who were now clashing with rural masses, um, even more so than state forces. So the main events in 9th March take place in the late 2000s. So um, I would just like to kind of conclude by speaking about um, the Maoist upsurge in West Bengal around the same time. So Maoists had been at that time launching sort of spectacular attacks on police installations in West Bengal and um, had begun to dominate the sort of arid western plateau which in, in um, West Bengal had been kind of dubbed um, Jungle Mahal uh, and that made up a sort of a corner of the tribal belt of, of India. And as we, we know from um, Night March, the, the most affected states have had these kind of isolated Adivasi populations in virgin forests, um, you know, usually on top of mineral deposits. So, but what set West Bengal apart uh, is that this early state campaign of sort of violent repression of sort of peasant movements was followed by sort of these incentives of agrarian reform. So this certainly set, sets it apart from places like Bihar and whatnot. And this had, you know, for many decades induced peasants more or less to put their weapons down. So, you know, um, it was the, the state's own sort of development programs and the, the um, ways in which they had been dis dispossessing these kind of rural communities that um, kind of turned the tables on them. In November 2008, a landmine blast hit the CPM ch chief minister's convoy in West Midnapur, um, sort of a uh, I guess a county of, of West Bengal, and this this must have been one of the, the most like high-profile kind of attacks <laughs> um, at the time. As he was returning from the proposed site of a Jindal steel plant in uh, Salboni, so without evidence or warrant, the police <coughs> launched reprisal against people in neighboring Lalgar. So villagers barricaded themselves in and um, news spread from village to village apparently with um, traditional Santal drums, Chantal drums and um, mobile phone. Um, and the solidarity from surrounding villages brought the movement, it, it spread it between districts. So 
the, um, the government at the time, afraid of um, sort of uh, repeating a massacre that happened just a couple of years before, where 14 protesters had been shot dead protesting against a special economic zone uh, in another part of the, the province, um, the, the government actually withdrew police. And um, the, during that time, the, the sort of, I guess, newly unified CPI Maoists um, were able to um, then get a significant presence in the state and lend their support and recruit in the region. And what I'd like to highlight here is that um, the, the organizers, they were from the neighboring regions of Jharkhand and Andhra Pradesh, but they tra trained local youth to defend their own earlier attempts at self-government. So these youth had been um, experimenting with sort of like direct democracy and sort of like more Gandhian um, forms of, of, of peaceful resistance and as ways of sort of bypassing party and traditional hierarchies. Um, so it was you know, of course, like state repression in this um, example that, that made them um, ally themselves with the Maoists. So it's not just a, a, um, that the, you know, that, I, I, that they certainly had agency and initiative in, in this scenario. Uh, and eventually, you know, the protesters, they destroyed the CPM's offices and, um, the, the Maoists proclaimed the area a liberated zone. So um, eventually, um, and, and another feature that kind of marks this, this off as well is that at the time, the, the Maoists, there were sharing platforms with independent activists uh, in, in Lalgar against the government repression there. And, um, you know, ha had actually, I think, a more of a contact with mainstream politics um, and a dialogue with other protesters and, and a major party, the, the Trinamool um, Congress, which is actually now in power and, and really quite opportunistically used struggles like this to, to show themselves, to, to sort of like outmaneuver the CPM from the left. Um, and the Maoists even supported an independent ca candidate um, called um, Chaturdhar Matal, who in the, uh, in the 2011 state elections, and he's, I think, still continues to be a political prisoner. So um, just to wrap it up, yeah. <laughs> um, just to sort of bring that to the pres present, um, the issue of land redistribution and agrarian poverty had been more or less ceded by the mainstream left to the Maoists, um, which you know, had led to the collapse of, the, of, of support for the CPM. So um, you know, since that flashpoint at the end of, the, of 2010, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a sad story what unfolds. Um, you know, Mamata Banerjee, um, who had offered her solidarity when she was in opposition, um, you know, within months of her taking power, the main leader of the movement, Kisanji, was, was killed by um, state security forces. But at the same time, I think this is an example of showing how, you know, to, to quote Frederick Douglass or misquote Frederick Douglass, power doesn't concede anything without demand. Um, since then, the state has offered some development and irrigation and whatnot and extra provisions to those areas. Um, but they've also, you know, encouraged surrenders and set up local vigilante groups and jailed more leaders. And um, that, that Jindal uh, plant that, w uh, that was supposed to be built there, the 4, 000, more than 4,000 acres of that land has, I think, still been left unused. And um, I think very recently in the last year, the Jindal group has started planning to build a cement plant in the, in the same place. So to conclude, um, I, just, you know, I think I'm bringing this sort of slightly different example to that is outside of the kind of um, purview of this book to, to um, you know, raise in the discussion that, you know, in a remarkable study such as Nightwatch, um, that the understanding of the trajectory of Indian Maoism requires, of course, as, as I think 
is very evident in the book, uh, look at very local specificities, which, um, and you know, even though the Maoists themselves often define themselves against parliamentary politics, uh, I think nonetheless it's important as an optic for identifying the contours of the movement. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Kaya. Um, so, questions, um, comments, contributions? Uh, we'll take a few and then Alpa will uh, come back to answer them. Paul Hudson, I'm here. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for your uh, talk. I found that absolutely fascinating. I ought to declare my lack of credentials. I have no expertise in this area, and some of my questions... Sorry, I beg your pardon. Is that, is that clear? Uh, they may say uh, naive, incoherent, or plain uh, ignorant. But uh, one of the things that um, struck me early on in your talk, you talked about a number of um, people who'd given up their studies and joined the... the uh, the Maoist movement, had they given them up, or in fact, has it been they've been excluded? The reason I ask that question is I have actually taught Indian students, but they were largely from East uh, Africa, not from India, so that may be critical. And one of the things that struck me is they are very concerned about doing well for the reputation of their um, families, or the prospect maybe of getting uh, married well, that was one thing. And uh, another thing that uh, impressed me, but I don't know whether I've drawn the correct inference, is there didn't seem to be any impression in my mind that the Maoists want to try and win hearts and minds. It seemed to be largely um, violent. And the, the last thing is that um, you referred to the injustices that the, uh, the Maoists felt, and that's, that's valid. I was just thinking, uh, in places like Kerala, which are, uh, are communist and one of the best educated states in India, I believe, if not the best, was there very much support from people from Kerala and the other better educated states for the Maoists? Did they recruit from these areas very well or not? Thanks, Paul. Hi. Uh, so uh, my question is regarding the the gender aspect of the Maoist movement. The Krantikari, uh, the Krantikari Adivasi Maila Sangatan is the women's front for the CPM Maoist, which is now banned. It's underground. It's operates in Maharashtra, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, all of those areas. So did you have a chance to interact with the activists who are a part of the organization? And also, if you did, did you happen to sort of you know ask them why did they join the movement? Because there are a lot of, uh, like I was reading your chapter on gender right now, and you have sort of mentioned about Anuradha Gandhi, who's also a part of that organization, and she happens to say that there are a lot of women who are a part of it. Plus, even in uh, The Burning Forest by Nandini Sundar, she also happens to say that the movement consists of 40% of women. So, you know, why do they join the movement? What is their perception about it? Because there are a lot of critique about the Naxalites and the way they handle the women's question. So, you know, this is a completely contradictory position taken by Anuradha Gandhi and, you know, who was already a part of it. So, yeah, what was your view on that? Uh, thank you, Alpa. I've just finished your book and it's excellent. Um, my question is about, um, you know, in India currently, so I belong from the sort of wildlife conservation dimension and I work in Chhattisgarh. Um, uh, my question is about, uh, currently in India, there is, there is a discourse about militarizing conservation itself as, as, as a perceived Maoist threat in these sort of parks. Um, uh, during your time with the Carders, did you come across any events that um, sort of corroborated the claim of many conservation NGOs that Naxals are taking part in the illegal wildlife trade. And uh, if, if not, could you also sort of uh, speak to some of the Maoist leaderships like Gyanji or Parasji about their sort of perceptions on environmental conservation, especially to do with these tiger reserves? Oh. 
Thanks. Alpa, first I want to congratulate you on what looks like a fantastic book and hopefully my next read. Um, and um, I have, I guess, two questions. One is related to a previous question on gender. But for me, it would be really interesting if you could expand on if you think the gender challenges that a, a movement like this faces are somewhat comparable with the, some of the challenges that the feminist movement in India is actually uh, grappling with, or you think instead that these are just different sets, and if you can just expand on that, if there, you know, it's because the adivasis or, uh, you know, what what can trace these differences. And the second relates to, uh, you know, uh, people like Ganji, so the, in a sense, the figure of the upper caste uh, Brahmin that somewhat is related to progressive social movements or like any type of social movement that is, is, is sort of, um, that emerged in India. So in a sense, my question is a bit like what really, um, what is particular about uh, the upper strata of the Maoist movement, if you consider that's pretty much the trajectory of all the social movements you had in India um, that are highly Brahminical, and perhaps that, in, in a sense, despite their aims, is also partially the limit that they uh, have, have shown. So if you could expand on these two things, thank you. Um, hi. I am three quarters blind. I'm three quarters blind. I'm I'm three quarters blind. So I want to buy a book, but I want to read it. But my question is more specific. I missed the po I missed the lecture because I couldn't see. I couldn't come here early. Anyway, my point is within the context of brick in general, bricks in general. And Modi's Hindutva, in particular, how significant is the slogan in Kalab Zindabad? Um, my question is about the philosophy of the Maoist movement. So, when the Naxalwari movement started, uh, it was the, it was based on the Maoist. Um, philosophy that rejects parliamentary democracy. So is uh, the current Naxal movement, is the end goal still to encircle urban areas, overthrow government authority, and completely um, do away with parliamentary democracy? And if so, what does that mean for India as a country and um, for the diverse peoples that make up India? And a parliamentary democracy in India has not been a total failure. It has given rise to um, the Minorities Act and SEST Act and um, participatory democracy movements like uh, the, the Panchayat um, movements. So I just wanted to ask what, if the Naxals do achieve their final goal, what would that mean for India and the rest of the people in India? <laughs> Hi. Um, what surprised me the most is that you mentioned that the Maoists fail to appreciate the fundamentally egalitarian social structures in Adivasi societies. Um, I've stayed in Adivasi villages myself and have witnessed this and found it to be incredible. And I was just wondering why um, there's this feature and what structures are the Maoists sort of trying to replace these with? Thanks, Apple, for giving us this uh, exceptional book and with a brilliant analysis of 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 what what the Maoists did and what they didn't do, what they understood and what they didn't understand. Uh, now, uh, what do you think is the future of them now? Uh, because even if they understood the uh, the, uh, the sea in which they swim better now. Would, would it still be? Would it simply be too late? With the with the Indian government taking such a, a draconian uh, um, uh, 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 perspective and practice in in relation to them, have they got a future at all? Uh, 
Um, hi, I was just wondering, um, did you run into any trouble with the government while you were doing this kind of quite astonishing like research, um, in terms of your research visas and stuff like that? Well, thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, one of the areas that government has focused in the last couple of years to reduce this noise threat is to strengthen the education system in these zones. That's obviously that's the perceived, the perceived, they perceive that as uh, one of the dimension which can actually kind of uh, reduce the impact of Maoism in this area. So what's your take on it and how uh, Maoists perceive education in this area, especially the government schools which may not be operating in that particular zone but which could be operating on the periphery of it. So what kind of dynamics are there between teachers, schools, the system and Maoists? Hi, um, thank you for a really compelling talk. I would like to ask you more about your research methodology. So I'm wondering, um, since uh, an ethnographer always seeks protection when studying conflict, I wonder what the role of terror and fear has been in your research and how did they receive your topics? And second, I would like to, um, is something about ethics. Is, um, if, um, did you set yourself any boundaries while on the field regarding cooperating with the militants? Yes, I didn't hear the last part of that. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, maybe. Uh, I wonder if um, you set yourself any boundaries while you were on the field regarding cooperation with the militants. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, this may be a simple question, but are they aware that they are being perceived as terrorists, or are they aware that they are, there are people globally who are in solidarity with them? And also, like, what do they want in terms of, like, internationally? Like, do they want recognition? Do they want support? Do they want aid? Would they be willing to work with, you know, more democratic, like, Western nations, or do they just want global hegemony? Last questions, and then I'll get up <laughs> to attempt to answer those. No? Okay. All right. I'll pass. Um, thanks so much for all of these really um, thoughtful questions, which are covering a wide range of issues. I am not sure I'm going to be able to just to do justice to everything, but I'll try and um, take them up in, in in several broad under several broad themes. So let's turn to um, I think uh, gender first, uh, and I just want to I didn't explain this last slide, but I, I just I'll bring it up. Um, so these are actually um, women from the um, uh, Women's Liberation Front, that, that, that picture there, which is actually um, from the cover of my book. So and this, was, uh, this is in Jharkhand. They were actually um, young Adivasi women who were um, posing for the photo. They borrowed the, the guns from their male counterparts, and they really wanted me to take the picture. And they were showing their faces, you know. And, I, I said, no, you know, I can't take a picture like that. You've got to hide your faces. Uh, and so, um, uh, so that's how that picture. So that's how that how that picture came about. This here, this meeting here, is um, the women's um, uh, is International Women's Day uh, in 2000, and I think this one was 2009. And. Uh, this is, uh, there I am, uh, that, that I'm, well I'm taking the photo, but there, there are my neighbours um, uh, who are going to International Women's Day. So there was this big me meeting celebrating the legacy of Clara Zetkin held in, you know, these, these forests in Jharkhand and these women going, going, these Adivasi women from the villages going to it. So 
Gender was really like a very um, big thing, uh, um, uh, in, 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 in has been a big thing in the, in the movement, just as mobilizing Dalits and Adivasis has been. Um, but um, it's quite, um, uh, I, I find it very interesting that this 40% figure, I think a lot of, a lot of uh, people who've written about the Maxites have been attracted to the idea of all these women taking up guns. And I guess what I'm trying to show uh, in my book is that the story is much more complicated than that. So in Chhattisgarh, I think the situation became very different uh, to, to the parts of Jharkhand I talk about after the Salva Judum, after the Salva Judum basically burnt and cleared um, villages. At that, after that moment, villages had no choice but to either go and join the guerrillas or they were or they ran away, or they, had, or they left and were displaced into neighboring states like <coughs> Telangana, uh, it's the most obvious place, but also parts of northern Andhra Pradesh and parts of southern Orissa. So, um, so what happened in the, in the movement then was that, the, that huge numbers of women um, ended up in the guerrilla armies because the, you know, there was no choice for any of these villages. People, the, 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 the armies expanded massively, the guerrilla armies expanded massively as a result of Salvajudum. So when you have like, you know, Arundhati Roy talking about 40% uh, you know, women in the movement, you know, that's, that, that was the case possibly in uh, part, certain moments in time in parts of, of, of Chhattisgarh. But what I've tried to draw attention to in the book is also the big, um, you know, to, to the kinds of questions that Alexandra was raising about the problems of um, gender and patriarchy within the movement, which I think are very similar to those that exist in, that feminists have been drawing attention to in India and exist in many other such movements. And uh, I think in this case, the, 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 the difference the particularity of the situation um, uh, is, is uh, whilst there are many commonalities with what the, the, uh, the complaints of, um, uh, you know, the, with, with how patriarchy works it, itself in this moment, the, 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 uh, the added kind of complexity or the added irony is that, uh, is that uh, Adivasi women in these areas are actually much more, in my opinion, gen egalitarian to their men or have a relative, a relative more independence and autonomy from their men than those in the neighboring plain areas, you know, which is what you were talking about that you experienced. And this is, I think, quite, this is not to say that, you know, Adivasi societies are egalitarian, there's no hierarchy and that women are totally equal to men, but it's, uh, you know, in everyday life, um, women work outside, women control the purse, women and men eat, you know, partake in drinking of, drinking of alcohol uh, uh, um, together and there's nothing taboo about this. You know, so there's lots and lots of kind of premarital and extramarital uh, relations are not as, as prohibited as they are in the plains. If you don't get on with your partner, you can leave. And it's not like look down on you, are incorporated into um, society or there isn't even an issue of reincorporation. It happens so often. So, so um, and this is a point that I think that the, the, the Maoists didn't kind of really get. Uh, you know, their overwhelming fo focus was on how Adivasis are so, uh, you know, how there is all this patriarchy in Adivasi societies and they are basically there to kind of save, save the Adivasis from their patriarchy. And in fact, uh, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I discussed this at length in the book. I, I, I talk about the, the, um, the debates and fights I have with, with Gyanji, uh, uh, who is the kind of, you know, trope of, of many other, is, who is the, so it's kind of archetypal trope of many other um, of these leaders um, uh, around, you know, their failure to take, to understand the, 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 what the egalitarian values that already exist within, um, within, within Adivasi society and how they might actually be giving rise to forms of patriarchy amongst Adivasi men uh, that didn't exist um, before. So it's actually, uh, in my opinion, a very, um, it's a very sad story uh, um, uh, 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 in, relation to, in, in relation to gender. So I'm not at all, you know, and, and I know that women like Anuradha Gandhi, who I never met, but, you know, I met women who had worked closely with her, um, you know, they, they were struggling with many of these issues 
but their, their own understandings of gender came from the plains. I mean, for her, it was Nagpur, you know, working in the slums of Nagpur. Uh, and then they came, they were all sent to these areas when it got very difficult to work in the plains. And so, um, you know, I, in, the, in the book I have a conversation, I, I talk about my relationship with a, a, a senior Naxalite leader called Seema, who has been brought from Andhra Pradesh, who I call Seema, and she's been brought from Andhra Pradesh when things got very unsafe for her there. Uh, um, and she was sent to Jharkhand to lead the women's movement there. And, um, and you know, I, I, in, I have these you know, she, she was looking to me to, to un understand Adivasi society better and I invited her to stay in my house with Somvari so that, you know, because I wanted her to experience what life was like for Adivasi women on an e everyday basis, which in my perspective was quite far removed from their kind of idea of, 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 of gender um, inequality and patri patriarchy. Um, so yeah, so there's many sem similarities, but also these added kind of ironies of working in this particular area, which I think is, for me, is, a, is one of the saddest parts of this of the story. Um, democracy, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, they they. So the the Naxites, as you said, you know, went. They decided that they're not going to take part in part parliamentary politics, that basically parliamentary politics is corrupting, uh, was corrupting. And, um, but uh, this was left at the level of tactics for many years, which meant that, in, uh, that, that people could, uh, that, that, that at any given point in time, they could change those tactics and, uh, and, and you know, maybe at some point engage in parliamentary politics. And certain parts of the Naxalites have done that. So, for example, CPIML liberation in Bihar is, is in part party politics. But in 2008, when um, the CPI Maoist was formed from a group of, many, from a group of different um, underground factions, they actually elevated uh, democracy, participation in elections to the level of strategy which meant then they decided that they wouldn't basically participate in elections at the level of strategy, which then makes it actually very hard to um, challenge within the movement. Um, but, you know, if you're thinking about democracy in a broader sense, and not in terms of just parliamentary po politics, I agree with you that kind of many great things have emerged out of, you know, the Indian constitution, out of, of, out of, uh, out of people's mass movements that have fought within the democratic uh, system. Uh, but if you look at d democracy in the broader sense, I mean, it's not that the Maxlites are against it. <laughs> they want something which they argue will be much more democratic, uh, just not through the present parliamentary process, which they see as being very um, corrupting. So, so yeah, so, so the event, and I cannot answer the questions about what the future is going to look like with them, you know. I mean, you know, I have deep suspicions of any of these movements, you know, and what they look like when they're eventually in power. And are they going to be any different from, you know, the Russian experiment? Is George Orwell's Animal Farm, you know, going to kind of ring true? You know, you, you know, you, 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 of course, you know, you have all of these concerns and you relate them down to, you know, people you met in the movement and there were, you know, wonderful people like Gyanji who meant well, but I think was really wrong on several of his analysis. And there's other people who were, you know, very dogmatic or, you know, who you couldn't really have a conversation with uh, because you were so bored by what they said because it was like a long speech. So, you know, there were all of these different kinds of, kinds of um, characters. So uh, I think what would be important is the kind of processes that they put in place to make democratic structures. Um, uh, education, uh, I didn't intend to say that, you know, they were giving up their studies. Uh, they actually continued their studies once they left the movement. Uh, and these were people who are highly educated, actually. You know, many had master's degrees, some were, they were doing PhDs. And these were people coming from the most privileged sections of society, uh, so they weren't, it were, I don't think exclusion uh, or being excluded was, from the system was an issue. Education, we, we had the question also about schools and whether, you know, schools are going to make a difference in this area. I, 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 I don't know because my, um, my, what I experienced with schools was that there were these school buildings and everybody wanted a school because, you know, these buildings were built and they brought in a lot of money uh, and, you know, so there were deals and deals taken 
and I talk about this in the book that they were, you know, they were basically all contractors all wanted money, um, took, took money in the process of the building of the school. Um, you know, there, there were ridiculous things like a small village of a hundred households had two schools built simply because they belonged to two revenue villages. The, the parts, the village actually was cut up into two hamlets, where each hamlet was actually officially registered in different revenue village. There were two schools serving a hundred households, no school teacher. You know, um, and um, so, you know, this is, where are the school teachers, you know, where, you know, that I, I used to teach at, at the local school as uh, whenever I was not, um, you know, interviewing somebody or going off on a hike somewhere or what, what I, I used to try and teach in the local school every day when I was living in the village itself. And often I was the only teacher there, even though, you know, the students turned up, they kind of played around, they had their free midday meal. Um, you know, there were four teachers on the books, there was a headmaster, but um, yeah. The headmaster had this long record of having allegedly raped, you know, four of the girls. I mean, it's so. Yes, UNICEF, World Bank had big school initiatives with the Jharkhand government. They put schools in these areas, but what have those schools done? I don't know. Um, so, sorry, two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh uh, well, future. The future. What is the future of them now? Uh, Jens's question. I don't know. I mean. Look, Rajnath Singh, yes, the last a couple of weeks ago put out a statement that now only 10 of the 12 districts that then, 10 or 12 districts of the country are affected. They're going to completely, you know, kill them off. And, uh, but, you know, there's been, this is, there's a long history to this movement, which is about, you know, re and repression and then the movement rising up again. So, I don't know what forms, how it's going to emerge. Um, what you can see happening is how it's given rise to, you know, Adivasi, how it's going to give rise to Adivasi movements. It's not surprising that the Gorkha, there's, you know, Gorkha movement now in the areas where, um, uh, you know, of, of Naxalbari uh, originally. So you can see how people get politicized through uh, their involvement in movements like this and then take on, you know, other forms, other causes. Uh, um, um, so, yeah. So, um, but I also find it very interesting right now, you know, with what the current situation and as Kayan was mentioning earlier, the, the, this whole, you know, branding of people as urban Naxites and actually how, and I, I heard actually that Sonia Gandhi, <laughs> Sonia Gandhi is now, you know, uh, allegedly uh, giving her support to the Naxites. So it's the way, at the very moment, <laughs> when this, when, at the very moment when this movement is being, um, you know, killed uh, militarily, you see it kind of re-emerging in all these other places where you least expect it and people being, you know, I mean, so all these things give life to an idea, you know, it, you know, not the movement itself, but the idea, the, the idea of resistance, revolutionary spirit, which in a way, um, I think, you know, nationalism is now standing for at this moment in time when the, when the fighters are being, you know, um, arrested or killed or killed in custody or, um, yeah, so um, I don't know, how much more time do I have? Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it, that's it. Well, maybe actually that's a good note to end on. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for your questions and yeah, I'm so, I, I'd be happy to talk to people afterwards, but yeah, I'm sorry I didn't get around to all of them, especially this interesting question about leaders and whether they're indifferent, but yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, I knew it. <laughs>